Hello and welcome to New Scientist TV. This month we'll be showing you how science could help soccer stars bring home the World Cup. We'll also show you how your eyes can deceive you. Don't trust them. But first, everyone knows about the shark's famous ability to sniff out a drop of blood in an ocean of water. Now a team is finding out exactly how the smell gets up their nose. James Urquhart tells us more. Here in London, Richie Abel is about to peer inside the nose of a hammerhead shark. Instead of dissecting the specimen, he puts it in a scanner and focuses a cone of x-rays on it. This will allow him to analyse the shark on his computer. If you take a, a loaf of bread and slice it yourself with a bread knife, afterwards you can pile up the slices one on top of each other to recreate the loaf of bread. Uh, using the CT scanner we carry out the same process but do it digitally and using x-rays. The scans can be used to create ultra-realistic virtual models, but they can also be translated to a 3D printer to produce a physical replica. Here in Cambridge, Jonathan Cox and his team have been studying one of these models. What we were looking for is flow through the nasal chamber. It had been suggested that that was what was going to happen, but nobody had actually shown it, nobody had actually seen inside the shark's nose uh, before. The experiments confirmed that a shark's swimming movement drives water through its nose. But it's still not clear how a smell reaches sensors in tiny channels that branch off the main cavity. There are about 100 in the specimen that we're looking at, and that's the problem it faces, trying to plumb or trying to get water through those channels. Their current model isn't detailed enough to resolve these tiny passages. So the team plans to create a new one from higher resolution scans. We've now been able to scan the specimen at approximately 50 to 60 microns resolution, which is about a twentieth of a millimetre, and should be double the resolution needed to image the thin lamellae and the small gaps between them inside the nostril. The team also plans to monitor the flow through the nose more precisely. By tracking tiny particles with lasers, they could finally uncover how sharks sense blood. Next, most of the time it's easy to tell what we're looking at. But how do our brains react when we can't? Sandrine Kirstenmal takes up the story. Here in Norwich, an installation plays with how we perceive the world. Point of perception is a large mirrored box filled with a network of wires. The grid was filmed and the video is projected back onto itself. This gives the impression that the wires are moving and the dimensions of the piece appear to change. You're at a point of ambiguity as to whether this is in fact a two-dimensional screen or is there depth there and if so, how much depth? And it's very difficult to, to, um, to figure that out. In his lab, Lotto studies similar illusions. They're helping to reveal how our brains process ambiguous information. So we have a metal diamond I'm going to spin it, and what you'll see initially is that it seems to spin in this direction. But if you keep looking at it, at some point, it'll look as if it flips and goes in the opposite direction. As far as your brain is concerned, the information coming from the diamond rotating this way is exactly the same as the information if it were spinning in the opposite direction. Lotto's illusions are deliberately designed to confuse our brains, but they also illustrate how we process ambiguous situations in everyday life. The light that falls onto the, onto the eyes from the world, it's ambiguous. Um, and the reason is because it conflates, it confuses multiple things about the world. In that example, what we have is a window with a piece of glass, okay? And that's sort of a metaphor for your eye. Any particular photon that falls under your eye could represent an infinite combination of lights and surfaces. But why can't our brains isolate the stimulus itself? And how do our brains choose between different possible interpretations? According to Lotto, what we perceive is based on our interactions with the world in the past. The brain didn't evolve to see the world the way it is. So it's not necessarily essential to see things as they really are. In fact, we can't see things as they really are because we have no access, direct access to, the th to those things. So instead, the brain evolved to see the world in the way it's useful to see. This isn't just the case for humans. 
Bees also perceive the world based on previous experiences. We can measure by tracking their flight, tracking their behavior, exactly what their experience is through the whole lifetime. And then we can relate that experience to what, how they behave, um, and also this architecture of their brain. It looks like they also see the same illusions that we see. Lotto hopes to make people aware that the way they perceive their surroundings is different from the physical reality. I'm very interested in creating those kinds of spaces of uncertainty because I think it's only from those spaces you can really get people to start thinking about what is it that I truly see and that's my personal aim for the point of perception is to put people in that space. Finally, as soccer teams gear up for the World Cup, we turn to a sports scientist for advice on how they can perfect their game. Valerie Jameson reports from Sheffield. Footballers at this year's World Cup will have another factor to contend with, altitudes. I'm here with Steve Hake. Now, what sort of altitudes will players face in South Africa? Well, the final will be in Johannesburg, uh, and that will be a little bit over 1,700 metres. Uh, but you've also got games at Cape Town at zero metres, and, and a few uh, in between 500 metres and 1,500 metres. Now, what sort of effect does altitude have on players? Well, the basic effect is the air pressure goes down as you go up with altitude, uh, and what that means is there's less oxygen in the air. And because there's less oxygen in the air, you've got less ox oxygen that you can use uh, for your body, and so your performance is going to decrease. People do do acclimatisation uh, routines, training camps uh, and so on. Acclimatisation chambers like this one can help people get used to a different altitude. To simulate conditions higher up, oxygen levels can be adjusted on a console. The air is then fed into a bag from where a person will breathe it in. Now, is it possible for me to go and try it for myself? Yeah, absolutely. Let's get you in there. Great. Inside the room, you need to wear a mask to acclimatise. It's attached to a tube that transmits air from the bag. This air contains 10 to 20% less oxygen than normal, so it feels like you're exerting yourself more while running. This is often what footballers experience higher up. So we know that altitude affects the players, but does it also have an effect on the aerodynamics? Well, yes, it does, because if the air density goes down, then the forces that the ball experiences goes down. And it's a strict proportion. So as the density goes down, the forces go down. So the drag will go down, and the way the ball swerves in flight will also go down. So is the altitude going to affect players' tactics during the matches uh, when they go from Cape Town at sea level up to Johannesburg at altitude? What will happen is the ball will fly slightly faster uh, at altitude. So what we might see is we might see uh, players taking chances where they take shots from longer distance because they will fly faster and that might fuel the goalkeeper a little bit better. Now the ball won't uh, swing quite as much, but certainly with the curling shots we'll find at altitude that the ball will arrive at a certain place like the goal faster than at sea level so that the ball might arrive two or three ball diameters ahead of where it would have done at sea level and goalkeepers really perceive that kind of thing. So is training at altitude the key to success at this year's World Cup? Well I think that the, the most important thing is going to be the altitude difference. It's this change in altitude that is the key and making sure that you've got enough days climatisation to get used to how the ball is flying at that altitude. That's all for now, but there are loads more videos to watch on our website. See how a new technique can animate impossible illusions. Or take a look at an airship that could soon house experiments in the sky. Thanks for watching. See you next time.